everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, which is part two of Appropriate Room Use. Today we're looking at imaging room classifications. This is one of 10 webinars hosted by the Facility Guidelines Institute on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction Documents. I'm Yvonne Chiarelli, Associate Editor with FGI, and I will be your moderator during today's webinar. FGI is proud to host this series of continuing education webinars. Developed to broaden understanding of the guidelines documents, the revision process, and to highlight key changes in the current edition of the guidelines. To obtain AIA credit, you will need to coordinate with the person who registered your organization on MADCAD. That person will be receiving follow-up directions by email. Each attendee seeking AIA learning units must complete a 10-question quiz on the content of this webinar in order to receive AIA continuing education credits. The views and opinions expressed during today's presentation are those of the presenters and may not represent the official position of FGI nor the HGRC. And now it's my honor to introduce to today's presenters. Brian Langlands is a principal, senior medical planner, and regulatory expert at MBBJ based out of the New York office. He helped the company to become recognized by Fast Company Magazine in 2018 as the most innovative architecture firm in the world. Brian has worked with many top academic medical centers and healthcare systems, including NYU Langone Health, Mount Sinai, Penn Med, Geisinger, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Jefferson Health, University of Rochester Medical Center, and Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Brian was a member of FGI's 2018 Health Guidelines Revision Committee and is a member of the 2022 Health Guidelines Revision Committee, as well as member of the Steering Committee and a chair of the Beyond Fundamentals Oversight Committee. And we have Tobias Gilk, who is a Vice President of RAD Plan Planning a consultancy specializing in medical imaging and therapy facilities. Toby contributed to the 2010 and 2014 guidelines editions in different capacities and is a member of the Health Guidelines Revision Committee for the 2022 edition. He has worked on imaging and intervention facilities across the United States, and RAD Planning has recently opened an office in the Middle East to serve clients in that region. Toby has also served the development of imaging facility standards for the U.S. Department of Defense, Veteran Affairs Hospitals, and the American College of Radiology. Thank you, Toby and Brian, for being here. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Brian Langlands. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, so I uh, want to thank everybody for uh, signing in today and listening to the webinar. Uh, Toby and I are very excited about um, the imaging, uh, the new classification systems and the work we've been doing on the 2018 FGI guidelines. And um, uh, this presentation actually is a the second part, meaning um, you're fine without having heard the part one. However, I would encourage you, if you have not listened to part one, um, there's a great webinar that David Shapiro and myself have worked on, which really focuses in on the exam procedure in operating rooms and the anesthesia work zone, which, give, which, which will give you a, a very good foundation for um, how they relate to the imaging room classifications. Um, uh, so the way the webinar is organized today is it's basically in, in two parts. The first part is that I will be giving a short recap, um, almost like a higher level overview. I won't be going into great detail, um, but uh, Toby and I thought it would benefit everybody if we just took a moment and uh, recapped some of the um, um, uh, more important uh, items uh, that we reviewed in part one. And then in part two, uh, Toby and I will be going through, primarily led by Toby with his expertise, um, the imaging room classifications and the types of cases. Um, and uh, we will follow that with just a very uh, short slide or two on uh, the fact that we have done uh, a bit of change within the pre and post procedure patient care uh, stations. So um, we 
do uh, want to thank everybody again for signing in. Um, and we are um, excited about uh, possibly having time left over to take a couple questions. Um, but we do know that even if we aren't able to uh, get your questions answered today, which I'm sure there will be some, uh, that there's uh, always an opportunity after. Um, I think uh, Yvonne will end with uh, sharing some of our emails, a uh, way to contact us, but also officially uh, from this webinar. I believe you can send in some questions or ask some questions and we will follow up with uh, formal uh, responses to those. So thanks again. Um, so I wanted to just take a moment um, and uh, if, uh, for example, you wanted to follow along, um, I just want to let you know in the recap portion uh, for part one, these were the sections that we actually reviewed uh, for the exam procedure and operating rooms and their associated uh, summary tables. For this presentation, particularly uh, part two, um, the applicable sections, should you have your books there with you and you want to look at them as we're going uh, through the presentation, um, uh, the applicable section for hybrid OR, and then the real, the real meat of this uh, bulk of this presentation is the imaging rooms, and that's the uh, section is shown there for both the hospital, which is the blue book, and then the orange book, which is the outpatient. So they're, uh, they're are listed and shown in different sections in those two in those two editions um, and then followed by the summary table uh, which uh, is listed for a hospital and outpatient so if you want to follow along um, on some of the uh, uh, work that we're showing and diagramming uh, it's all there and primarily in those sections so now uh, Toby is just going to fill us in a little bit uh, on the importance of you know the planning process and what we do before uh, I hop back on and really talk about the part one exam rooms procedures and operating rooms so Toby welcome thank you very much Brian um, uh, I'm thrilled to have the chance to bring this information to everyone um, before we really get into this and I want to, want to set the stage for you um, about why the the imaging classification system. I mean, it's great to get in and teach you, you know, what it is and how it's applied, but I think it makes a whole lot more sense if you understand the rationale for why it exists in the first place. Um, if we look at medical imaging services, um, over the last 10 20 years, uh, medical imaging has just changed astronomically in terms of the way that it's applied clinically. And probably the single most impressive change after the technology itself is the clinical utilization and the scope creep of the way in which we use imaging services. Um, compared against 10 or 20 years ago, we're dealing with patients who have higher, in some cases significantly higher um, acuities. Um, we are now using imaging not just for diagnosis, but as a platform to support intervention. Both of those, the acuity and the level of intervention, um, come with increased levels of use of general anesthesia or heavy sedation. So the result of all of this is that imaging services because of the new spectrum of clinical applications and, and acuity and levels of intervention, we really need to tailor a set of design criteria that responds to the patient care needs above and beyond the piece of equipment that we're putting in the room. And that is the justification, the rationale for the development of the imaging classification system. The classification system really seeks to break down the design criteria for an individual room, first and foremost, based on what we're doing to the patient. And Brian's going to get into some examples that we're familiar with in other sections of the FGI from before 2018 that will really help set the stage for a more comprehensive understanding of what the imaging classification system does for us. Now, one of the burdens that this creates is it expects more of the designer, the planner, the you know, facility master planner, the architects, the engineers. It expects more of us because it really demands that we develop 
program information. Program information that previously was nice to have, but it wasn't really necessary to execute a design. Well, today, with the imaging classification system, if you don't know whether a CT suite is going to be used in support of image-guided biopsies, then you don't really know how to design that room. You don't know the, the classification, the infrastructure requirements, the space requirements. And all of that is driven by the ways in which we use this imaging resource for patient care. In effect, in shorthand, what we have done is we have put patient care before modality-specific design requirements. So if you keep that in mind, and I'm going to turn it over now to Brian, and keep in mind the historical precedent of where else within the guidelines, where else within the hospital we have done this, then the imaging classifications will make that much more sense to you. So, Brian? Great. Uh, thanks, Toby. So, uh, as I mentioned in the overview, uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes and uh, dive into uh, what we focused on in part one uh, and really give you a, a high-level recap on the exam procedure room, operating rooms, uh, minimum requirements. The importance of this is that uh, I think what you're going to see is you're going to see how there are synergies um, and similarities between exam procedure operating rooms and when Toby gets into class one class class two and class three imaging rooms, it's it's all going to come together. So um, uh, one of the most important things is really understanding uh, what type of room you need and what procedures are happening within it. And if you want to uh, simplify it down to uh, sort of easy terms, we have three types of rooms. You need to figure out what room you uh, is appropriate for what you plan to do in it. And the first type of room is the exam room, or what we call the treatment room, which is essentially within the ED itself. And non-invasive activities should be occurring within this room. Um, and within this room, it comes with certain criteria, uh, which we're going to get into. But the real question you have to start is uh, asking yourself in the planning and, and programming uh, portions of uh, designing projects or working with clients or also institutions themselves is, when do I start doing procedures which may be um, starting to become, uh, uh, well, moving towards invasiveness, uh, if you will? Uh, am, I, am I puncturing the skin? Am I doing a stitch? Am I, doing, um, am I inserting something into a person? Uh, are there things that uh, I want a cleaner type room uh, and uh, that room, um, uh, that work should not occur within the exam room. So the procedure room, uh, by determining that between the two, it's the safety risk assessment. This is where all the people come together you have your infection control, you have your surgery people, you have your procedure people, regulatory, designers, planners, everybody, operations, uh, discussing how the rooms are going to be used, what you're planning to do, and it's that risk assessment that determines uh, whether you should be building or uh, doing um, uh, specific types of uh, things within an exam room or the treatment room. Along the spectrum, uh, if we continue to move forward, it's the same uh, decision that needs to be done between the procedure room and the operating room. Uh, when, when does one use the operating room rather than a procedure room? When is it appropriate to use the procedure room uh, and you don't need all the infrastructure and cost of an operating room? And really, uh, we really have to look at the uh, risk assessment. And in the simplest term, the operating room is uh, designed and meant for invasive procedures. That really is what um, uh, the bulk of it is. If a procedure is invasive, and this is a definition that is from the FGI uh, 2018 glossary, um, it's in its simplest for form is uh, basically uh, a procedure that penetrates uh, a portion of the body that normally is not exposed to the environment. What does this mean? It means that you are, um, you are opening up the body uh, 
and uh, creating a cavity that is not normally colonized by bacteria. So this is not your mouth, this is not your ear, it's not your eye, uh, which actually are all colonized with bacteria already. This is um, making, um, you know, uh, an insertion or opening, and you're actually exposing a sterile portion of the body um, to the environment. And as that opening or that uh, work where you're concentrating on is larger or deeper or greater, your 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 uh, risk of infection increases um, measurably. And if the risk of infection is high, then we determine that this is an invasive procedure and must be done in an operating room. So it's all about invasiveness, which really means it's all about the risk of infection. So um, just taking a step back, what do we do when we start a project? Or what do we do when we start to determine what can happen in what types of rooms? We ask questions. We ask questions of level of invasiveness. What is the likelihood of infection? What type of anesthesia is going to be used? Uh, how much staff is going to be in the room when the procedure is taking place? How much equipment is needed in that room to support the procedures? And then when you start getting all that information together, you really start building a, a, a framework in understanding what room classification you're looking at. Are you looking at an, the simplest uh, exam treatment room, a procedure room, or an operating room? And with each one of those, you're also determining how, how large the room can be or should be, uh, what the finishes and the surfaces in the rooms are, and then uh, very importantly, the room infrastructure, the mechanical systems, the air changes, how much electrical, is it an emergency? This is all in the, in the dialogue as we are working out and building towards uh, figuring out what needs to be built. Now, you start building it up from that direction, and you figure out you need X number of one type of room. You build those rooms. Um, what's important to understand is that once the rooms, rooms are built, then the rooms in a way start to define what you can do in them. So it is very important, as Toby also mentioned at the very beginning, is to have the discussions as to what might occur in these rooms now that we're not thinking about that maybe we should plan for. Um, what future flexibility um, should we uh, anticipate or build in? And also where, especially with procedure rooms, where should these rooms exist? Um, what w w within, the surgical, um, within the surgical environment itself? So um, the three types of rooms um, uh, and um, Looking through them, we have the exam room, the treatment room, and the operating room. And if you go through, uh, we have the room uses. Um, what you can see is really, and I'm not going to read the, um, the uses, but really when you're going from exam room to operating room, you are basically going from non-invasive to invasive. The location of the rooms are listed here, which I have a diagram for. And we're going to be focusing in um, we, well, we won't be, but what I will say is that in part one, we really spent a lot of time on the ventilation requirements and how they're different from each type of these three spaces. And we also spent a lot of time talking about the surfaces um, for each of these three types of spaces. So at a high level, um, just if we just want to peel off one of those columns, which is location, the exam room, non-invasive, uh, is accessed from an unrestricted zone within the surgical suite. The procedure room, and this is where a lot of thought needs to be given, the procedure room actually can straddle, not straddle, the procedure room can exist uh, or be accessed from an unrestricted zone or area, or it could be decided operationally to be located behind the red line and accessed from the semi-restricted zone, which is uh, where we actually can only access an operating room from. Um, the placement of the procedure room uh, needs to be thoughtfully considered 
as there are operational and protocol implications uh, associated with whether uh, what side of the red line it's on. So I think this needs to be seriously thought about and considered uh, when deciding where that procedure room might go. Now, um, uh, in part one, we actually went into each one of these spaces and showed all the clearances and built them all up. But here, I'm just going to show you quickly that if you were to take out uh, and try to draw what is in the guidelines for clear floor area and minimum uh, clearances or minimum clear width, this is what you would see. This, these are the types of spaces in their simplest form um, that we talked about in, um, in the part one. There are many other spaces, uh, trauma rooms, behavioral health, um, you know, specialty ORs. We did not focus in on those, but if you just wanted to simplify and draw out what the exam treatment procedure and operating rooms uh, minimum requirements are, this is what you would see. Um, I think Toby will go into it later, but uh, FGI is really about um, building up from the minimum requirement. The reason we have minimum requirements is so people understand a threshold that you cannot go below. We do not recommend nor endorse that all ORs should be 400 square feet, that all outpatient uh, exam rooms should be 880 square feet. What we are saying is they cannot be less than this, and this is your starting base, and please start building from here when you start figuring out what you're doing within those rooms. So the other thing that we focused in on uh, with the uh, part one was the uh, determining and the zone or the amount of space that is required for the anesthesia work. So we all know the anesthesiologist needs essentially 360 degree uh, radius at the uh, top of the patient's head. Um, what we did was we actually had a multidisciplinary uh, simulation group uh, in the picture here. Uh, it's actually uh, architects uh, and uh, an anesthesiologist um, at Northwestern University. They they lent us one of their ORs, which is actually um, uh, a, a larger sized OR. Um, and you'll see that the anesthesiologist needs that activity or that space at the head. So we found that it was very important for us to at least in FGI try to determine for the first time what a minimum uh, size is required in order to um, uh, safely set up all the equipment uh, and then actually how much space you need when the um, when the procedure is taking place. Um, what we came up with was a uh, rectangle at the uh, head or near where the uh, patient's head is, where the anesthesiologist is, of 48 square feet and that is six feet by eight feet. And should you have an OR layout where you require to circulate above and around the anesthesiologist, we did acknowledge that once the procedure is underway, the uppermost uh, portion of that um, anesthesia work zone could be used as a circulation pathway if required. We do see that many operations don't require that and uh, equipment will be up against the wall um, towards, uh, towards that northern portion. So, with that, um, that's sort of a recap or a little framework of what you'll find in part one. And then Toby is going to build on this um, with uh, all the information in the uh, imaging room classification section. Thank you again, Brian. Um, and it may seem a little odd that we begin the imaging classification um, webinar with information about exam and procedure and OR spaces, um, but I think it will become um, self-evident to you here very shortly why we, why we chose to begin it, begin it that way. Um, so before we get into that, I want to talk about the sort of structural or organizational changes that we made in the 2018 edition besides the imaging classification. So in the 2014 edition, you know, we had imaging services and we really kind of grouped the diagnostic imaging, imaging services together. And then we grouped separately the interventional imaging services. And then we grouped separately the specialized in the nuclear medicine predominantly as a separate group. 2018, not so much. 
2018, we essentially said, well, if you're doing it with an imaging resource, if, if you are somehow creating an image, taking a picture of the patient, it is imaging. Um, now, some of that is very practical from the standpoint of today, you can't actually go out and buy a new standalone PET scanner in the United States. There is no such FDA approved um, device in, currently in manufacture in the United States. If you want a PET scanner, it's actually glued today in the US. New PET scanners are glued to either a CT scanner or an MRI. So what used to be a standalone nuclear medicine imaging resource is now hybridized with a more conventional radiology modality. So the, the basic increment of what defines a department and you know, the modality that we use for imaging, um, the, the lines are being blurred and, and now we have hybrid nuke med radiology. So we essentially, we read the writing on the wall and we said this is the direction that the industry is going. Um, so we're going to group everything as imaging services. Um, so what previously was imaging and interventional imaging and nuclear medicine is now all imaging. Um, to differentiate between the diagnostic uses and the um, therapeutic or the, the image guidance for therapy or uh, procedural benefit process to help illuminate those differences, that's what the class structure really does, is it helps to identify the difference between run-of-the-mill diagnostic imaging and what we do that is interventional and what we do that really is operative but is informed by imaging resources. So I stole one of Brian's slides um, and I modified it a little bit, see if you can tell the difference. So Brian showed this slide and he talked about exam, procedure, and OR environments. And funnily enough, I can use the exact same slide, but I can retitle it class one, class two, and class three. These correlate, the classification scheme correlates exactly with those distinctions that you have become familiar with over years and years and years. We are essentially borrowing the exact same structure and we're applying it to imaging resources, wherever they may be in the enterprise. Um, and they may be many, many different places throughout the enterprise. We now have you know, imaging in women's health. We may have a CT associated with a cardiology practice or a subgroup within the hospital. Um, you know, we bring imaging into um, pain interventional services with portable C-arm, and we have you know, C-arms and ultrasounds and God knows what today in surgical environments. So imaging as a resource is distributed throughout the enterprise. Um, and this only heightens the, the acknowledgement that radiology and imaging services have changed so dramatically. Just as an illustration, if we were designing a CT suite under the 2014 or prior editions of the FGI guidelines, it would, we would say, well, it's a CT suite and it would give us one set of design criteria. And that criteria for the, the CT suite would be equally true if we were putting this in a physician's office or if we were putting it in a diagnostic imaging department or if we were putting it in an ED for stroke assessments or if it was a portable CT and it was going into an OR. Um, the basic criteria for designing the CT function of any of those would be identical when we all know that the workflow and the infrastructure and the patient care demands are going to be radically different. So a CT is not a CT, is not a CT irrespective of where we put it. Where we put it and the anticipated patient clinical use are more important than the technical criteria for the, the device itself and the modality itself. So, 
Um, again, I stole slides from Brian. Brian did this before where he did exam procedure and OR. And I'm showing you the exact same thing, only we are retitling it class one, class two, class three imaging. But you should understand this to essentially be exam or as we would have referred to it historically, diagnostic imaging is class one. And this is where we do little else, but perhaps give the patient intravenous IV. Um, we can do anesthesia in class one if the anesthesia is for the exam. Uh, that means that if we have a patient who has severe anxiety or claustrophobia, and the only way that we're gonna complete this exam is you know, by sedating the patient, but that's permissible under class one as long as we provide the infrastructure associated with anesthesia. Um, and by that, I mean emergency power for the equipment and med gases for you know, the ventilation requirements. But with those, you can do anesthesia for an exam in class one. Class two, we can actually begin to cut into the patient with minimally invasive types of procedures. Um, now, if we're doing anesthesia or sedation in class two, it's not just to complete the exam, it's for the patient because the patient quite simply could not tolerate what we are doing to them. That's sort of the, the critical distinction between um, anesthesia for the benefit of the exam and anesthesia or sedation for the benefit of the patient and the patient tolerance. And then class three imaging is, is surgical, surgery with imaging resources. Um, also, we refer to this as hybrid OR. In hybrids, or at least the way that it's been described in the in FGI and elsewhere, it, it presumes a, a fixed imaging resource or you know a, something built in. Maybe that it travels between two rooms or something like that. But you know, it is a dedicated surgical resource. Um, really, class three imaging could include anything that we might wheel into the OR as well. So portable C arms, portable ultrasound machines. If we are using image guidance, imaging to inform a surgical procedure, that is, in effect, class three imaging. Um, I suspect that you know, if we were doing this webinar 10 years from now, we would be looking back then, like we do today, at you know, eight track tapes. We would be thinking, well, why on earth would anybody do any surgical procedure that wasn't informed by imaging? Um, I think that that's the direction that we're going and probably won't be too terribly long before most surgical procedures are class three imaging procedures because they will be imaging informed. And as long as I'm stealing slides from Brian, I figured I would steal this one also. Now, when Brian showed you his version of this slide, it gave you explicit square footage associated with the different types of rooms, an exam room, a treatment room, a procedure room, different types of ORs. Um, so this is what the imaging section of the 2018 FGI has to say about room sizes. We don't say much about room sizes. Um, now, that's for two different reasons. One of them is Let's just take an MRI as an example. So most of us are familiar with the, the bore type, the tunnel type MRI, right? And there are different products, different vendors that are different sizes. You know, some of them are a little longer, some of them are a little wider, some of them have different service clearances around them. Fine, we can develop a, a design criteria that would capture the worst case of those. But that's not the only type of MRI there is. There are dedicated extremity systems. There are high field vertical open systems, the ones that look like two hamburger buns, the top one levitated from the bottom. There are transverse imaging systems that look like the hamburger buns turned on their side, or some of them now look like tacos that you kind of crawl in between. Each one of these different MRI types, different systems, different vendors, different formats have different design criteria. So if we develop a worst case design template that would allow you to put in whichever piece of equipment it was, for the vast majority of folks who are probably putting in tunnel type MRI, we would have over designed or, or put too much minimum requirement in for your particular needs. So instead of doing that, we 
um, define the equipment space or ask that you define the equipment space and then we define minimum clearances around the circulating sides of the equipment. For most cases, that's four foot around the circulating sides. Um, for the standing modalities, mammography or ultrasound, if we're doing, you know, uh, ultrasound of the carotids, for example, we don't need a full exam table. We don't need the full circulation space around it. So at its minimum, and again, I'll reiterate what Brian said, um, the minimums are not our recommendations. They are sort of the floor below which you should not go. Um, but the minimums for the, the potentially standing patient um, modality is mammography and ultrasound drop down to three foot clearance. Um, but it's up to you to determine what's going to be best for your specific situation. So, um, with respect to room locations, and again, Brian covered this, uh, class one is an unrestricted, um, and I'm just stealing all Brian's slides. Class two imaging resources are procedure rooms. They're just imaging informed procedure rooms, and we can do the exact same thing. We can drop um, class two rooms either outside the red line that defines the, um, the clean environment or inside the red line next door to or in the same region as our class three ORs or hybrid OR spaces. So again, you are finding me repeating a bunch of the things that Brian was saying because they're based on the same criteria. So class one rooms, uh, they can be pretty much any modality that the only thing or the most invasive thing that we're planning on doing is giving the patient IV contrast perhaps, um, maybe just an IV. Um, uh, we're not cutting open anything. Maybe we're doing a natural orifice entry or something like that, but that's that's about the worst of it. So those are examples of what you might expect to see in uh, class one. Um, class one, even though we call it diagnostic imaging, it can be used in an inpatient facility. We can have class one designated facilities that are really only serving diagnostic purposes. Um, just because your hospital doesn't mean every imaging resource you have has to be an interventional platform. Um, you can designate some of them to serve diagnostic functions. And again, you can use sedation or anesthesia with medical gases and emergency power um, if you are doing it for the benefit of the exam. Um, when it gets to the level of patients, that's the different story. This is essentially just sort of clipping out that one row from the table that we've seen before. And just reiterating, um, you know, the, it can be pretty much any modality that we're using as something strictly on a diagnostic, uh, for strictly a diagnostic purpose. Um, we're not going to do any interventions um, because, as Brian described before, the level of infection risk is relatively low. Uh, we really don't need to have any specific access restrictions. Air changes can be really low. Um, comparatively speaking, and the surfaces are just the, the surfaces that you would have in, in an exam room for the most part. So that's class one. Um, oh, and the clearances, and this is just uses the information from the table where I, uh, the example where I showed all three of them. Um, reiterating, it's about operational clearances around the equipment zones. Um, it is not about prescriptive, thou shalt be 182 square feet. Um, the program for the, the space needs depends on what it is you need for the equipment, what it is you need for the operational clearances, what it is you need in terms of fixed contents in the room besides the equipment, um, and that will really begin to drive for you the minimum uh, size and siting requirements. Um, so these are minimums, again, and we encourage you to identify the needs for your specific situation and figure out to what degree you need to go above those. So class two imaging rooms, um, you may know these by other names, an IR suite, a cath lab, a special procedures, pain clinics. Um, these are all examples of, of what today we call class two imaging procedure rooms. 
So we can do diagnostics. We can always go down in acuity and serve uh, lower acuity functions and purposes. Um, we can't go up. We can't do, we ought not do open procedures in the class two imaging room. Um, so we can go down, we can do diagnostic purposes or, or functions in a class two room. We can serve inpatients and outpatients. These can be located either in hospitals or in outpatient types of setting. Um, as with the class one, we can use contrast. Here we can use sedation or anesthesia for either reason, either just to make it so that the exam can be completed or because we're going to do something that a patient simply couldn't tolerate without anesthesia or sedation. Um, we can do image-guided biopsies and procedures, um, such as an MRI-guided breast bi biopsy, cardiac cath. All of these represent uh, class two functions. Um, and as Brian was illuminating at the beginning with the, the boundary conditions between class one and class two, or class two and class three, although he called them exam procedure and surgery. Same thing happens here in imaging enabled services. So example, uh, trans aortic valve replacement tappers. Um, these are minimally invasive uh, catheter enabled procedures. However, if the procedure goes awry and you need to crack the patient's chest, now all of a sudden a minimally invasive procedure can turn into a surgical procedure. And so, you need to conduct a risk assessment and identify how you wish to handle um, the, the risks, what the presumed likelihood of these negative outcomes might be, and how you're going to handle them to make a determination for these gray area procedures, whether you elect to handle them as class two or class three. That determination, if it doesn't fall into one of the clear cut categories, is that of the facility following a risk assessment. So this again um, rehashes the, the prior slides and this is where we've cut out um, the criteria specific to class two imaging. And if you go to the right of the slide and you look at the surfaces and finished materials, um, if you compare this to the finished materials that are required of, of procedure rooms, you will find this to be very similar because it's pretty much the same. And as with the class one uh, rooms, class two, the space requirements for any individual room are driven by the equipment space requirements plus operational or circulatory clearances between the equipment and any, any fixed obstruction in the room. So while the values change a little bit depending on our classification and the individual modalities, the general principle is consistent throughout. We're talking about the service classes around. So um, with respect to system component rooms, um, equipment rooms associated with an imaging modality or device, one of the changes that is in the 2018 guidelines, and most of the time we've been talking about kind of big picture organizational stuff, this is more of a tactical element, is when there is an infection control potential between a, a high susceptibility, high risk uh, infection area, an operative environment, for example, um, and an area that we can't terminally clean. You cannot terminally clean the system component room. So we, uh, the, the 2018 guidelines essentially say because of this potential you know, existent um, risk of infection for high-risk patients and a room that you can't terminally clean, um, we will no longer permit direct access from um, the OR procedure room into a system component room. Those need to be accessed, the system component rooms need to be accessed from semi-restricted or non-restricted space. Uh, to reduce the, the risk of potential infection in those environments. Um, which segues nicely into the general uh, class three, or you may also know this as hybrid OR. Um, anything that we do where we are slicing the patient open and we are using imaging in some point in that surgical procedure um, to inform 
the you know the the care that we're delivering to the patient, that is a class three imaging resource. And again, it can be fixed. You know, uh, C arms you know mounted to the wall or the robotic systems off of the floor, or it can be mobile equipment that's brought into the room specific to that case, and that purpose. Um, the control room, control alcove, uh, when we provide control rooms, control alcoves for uh, class three imaging procedures, um, there is a desire to facilitate, you know, um, going back and forth and conferring with the, the radiographer, or the, the technologist. Um, so when these rooms, when the control area is open into um, the, the procedure room, um, which we can do in class two, um, both of those need to be treated with the same air changes per hour, the same pressure relationship. We can't, can't have a, a space that opens into the, the uh, procedure room um, and essentially shares air, be at a different pressurization, a different air changes requirement. Because of the exact same infection control risk that we talked about for the system component room, we're removing that flexibility. We're removing, well, we're simply not giving that flexibility. It wasn't there in the previous editions, but there must be a, a separation uh, between the, the control room and the, the imaging enabled OR. Now, control rooms can be shared. So if you have multiple imaging informed class three rooms or hybrid ORs, um, you can have a single control space that serves multiple ORs, um, but at class three in the operative environment, they just, they can't open directly into the OR space. So this is by no means meant to be exhaustive. Um, this is just a list of some of the potential procedures um, that might be conducted in uh, class two, class three types of spaces. Uh, this list is not here to, as I say, it's not meant to be exhaustive. What we do intend to show with this is that this is not just radiology. This is not just radiologic special, specialties. Um, we have cardiovascular, cardiothoracic, neurovascular, pain, interventional radiology, you know, a number of specialties. Um, that would make use of these types of resources. Um, so while we call it, you know, radiology because they're imaging, um, it's not necessarily just uh, radiology clinical practices. Oops, oh, and my slides jumped ahead on me. Let me back up. So the class three imaging, again, this is just a table that, that distills what we have been talking about. If you zoom over to surfaces, again, if you look at the surfaces under class three imaging and you go back and you look at the surfaces and finished material that are permissible under surgical environments, you will find them to be pretty much the same because we stole them from surgery um, so that it's perfectly clear no matter which section you're working from, whether you're in surgery and you work back to imaging or you start in imaging and you work back to surgery, we wanted there to be no conflicts. And as with class one and class two, again, we define the equipment operational zone, we define the minimum circulatory space, functional space around the imaging resource, um, between the imaging resource and any fixed obstruction. We do not prescribe um, fixed square footages. Now, um, when you get into the surgical environment and the hybrid OR, which presumes, you know, sort of C-arm kind of configuration, there are prescriptive uh, square footages for hybrid ORs. But the class three, because we can do surgical procedures with a portable ultrasound cart, it's really focused on equipment and operational clearances specifically. So this is a mashup of Brian's slide and my slide. He had exam, procedure, OR. I had class one, class two, and class three. And if you compare them side by side, you quickly realize that even though class one, two, and three are particular to imaging resources, 
we're really describing the exact same thing. We're just describing it in different contexts. So here's a comparison between the class one imaging room and an exam or treatment room. Um, and these are effectively the same. There are some teeny tiny little differences depending on um, exam or treatment, but otherwise we're essentially talking about exactly the same thing. And the same thing with class two imaging and procedure, and the same thing with class three imaging and OR. Again, differences coming into play pertain mostly to the differences in prescriptive square footage um, for a hybrid OR, which presumes sort of the uh, C-arm type of system, um, with the flexibility of class three um, imaging informed surgical procedures can really be done with any imaging resource. Um, and so that's, that's the gist of that. And Brian, I think I stole some of your slides, didn't I? Well, yeah, but I'm good at sharing. So, so that's perfectly fine. I, I, I think the important point here, which is uh, uh, the reason that Toby and I uh, wanted to do this seminar, uh, this webinar together, is that Toby was heavily involved and one of the leaders uh, within the imaging um, sort of revamping of that entire section for FTI. And he's such an expert. And I was one of the people involved and one of the leaders of the sort of procedures and operating room group. And although we worked separately um, by talking and getting together and sort of going back and forth, we recognized that it would be really good if we could align each of these rooms uh, where uh, they, they, they were more comparable and easier to understand. I think up until uh, the 2018 guidelines, we really felt that you know exam, procedure, and operating rooms are their own thing, their own requirements, and you have to look here for the information. And that quite differently are the different, we didn't have the classification systems, uh, the different uh, imaging rooms, you know, CT, MRI, um, ultrasound, MAMO, PET, you know, all these things. And we felt that all of them were very, very different. But what we wanted to do was to actually break it down and say the rooms and the infrastructure themselves are pretty similar. Um, and we try to explain that. Uh, and what really is the difference between the two is working through uh, what room is appropriate and then what size those rooms need to be. So um, the slides that we've been showing right now where we're showing the imaging um, sort of with the operating rooms and uh, class two and class one and exam and procedure is the pulling together of all that information. So in wrapping up here, you'll see in this slide, we wanted to simplify it if possible, that when you're determining um, the room by use, uh, you really, uh, the three classification uh, rooms are there. Um, it is fluid and um, amorphic, so uh, it, there's never one clear item that says this is a room you need to use. So we're looking, uh, coming full circle to what we started in the presentation, is you are looking at what level of invasiveness is. And when you start non-invasive, obviously class one, you're, you're moving, becoming a little invasive, you're getting into class two, and somewhere along that spectrum, you're beginning to say, I need a room that's class three. Usually um, all of that is the infrastructure that you need is uh, assigned or understood by the risk of infection, which is related to the level of invasiveness. Then in, because the uh, risk of infection is higher or greater with a uh, class three invasive procedure, that is where um, Toby went into um, depth in really explaining the 20 air changes per hour, the laminar flow and things like that. And with the non-invasive and low, we see the lower air changes per hour and the um, simple or typical diffuser array. And then we actually look at uh, the infrastructure room finishes uh, are impacted uh, 
when uh, selecting each type of room and uh, what room we're actually moving forward with. And then the room size really comes about by looking at the number of staff required um, to do the work that you're planning to do in the rooms. Obviously, the type of an anesthesia, that means typically when you have full general anesthesia, you have more equipment and you have more people, so therefore you're looking at a larger size room. That goes hand in hand with the anesthesia and other items that you might have. And in these imaging rooms, uh, as Toby mentioned, you might have more portable equipment within that room to support uh, particular procedures. So uh, that factor needs to be taken into account. And as Toby clearly mentioned, the difference between the exam procedure and operating room is that we actually give uh, clear minimum requirements for clear floor area, a clear dimensional width within the room. We do not do that with the imaging rooms. With the imaging rooms, uh, which was explained, I think, uh, quite well, the types of equipment are so diverse and ever evolving that to provide a minimum room size would not benefit, I think, what we're trying to do. And you really need to build up the room size from everything we've been talking about today, along with the circulating clearances about that particular piece of equipment. So that essentially wraps up what we really wanted to share today. The one thing we wanted to just uh, point out at the end of the presentation is that we all know we have pre and post procedural patient care areas and Often they are in separate areas, but we are seeing these merged and uh, uh, Sort of existing within the same space with no physical separation between the two and we in 2018 guidelines if you look at the top row here, there's a, an acknowledgement that you can combine the pre and post positions. And if you do that, for example, if they're combined for a class two or class three imaging room, you can have two positions uh, per one type of those rooms. If you actually separate them into two or three areas, uh, the minimum ratio listed in the FGI guidelines is that you need one pre, one PACU, and one phase two for each class two and class three type rooms. So therefore, by having them separated, the minimum ratio uh, increases where you actually need one to three. So this is something you should consider. We do know that there's some great operational efficiencies by blending them together. It does come at a cost, and that cost is greater square footage. Um, in some ways for the particular rooms because a PACU bay is larger than what's required for a pre-op room, which often has a chair in it. However, you may save on some square footage because you're actually having one shared sold room instead of three separate ones. The other consideration and cost is the infrastructure. When you combine them, you must combine. Uh, you must design all of them to the um, strictest, uh, sorry, most restrictive one, which is the PACU. So therefore, you will be designing uh, ones that you may be wanting primarily to use it pre uh, as a pre-op, but flowing into them later in the day. Those are going to have to be designed with the full uh, medical gas complement, uh, emergency power complement, and all the other elements and factors that come with a PACU. So there's some cost. There's also, uh, with them together, there's great operational efficiency, but you also need to consider what type of patients you have, um, what um, turnover rate you have, and the fact that if they're all together, uh, depending on how you place people, you could have a pediatric patient or you could have a pre-op patient directly next to 
a patient who is coming out from a very very serious um, uh, operation who's uh, just just coming to so these are things that you have to factor in when you're really looking at the pre and post procedure care area but we did want to share this with you because we think it's something um, that people will take advantage of because I know I, I've designed quite a number of spaces where uh, the pre and post is all is all flexed together so um, I think it's just um, Toby actually uh, wrapping up here with uh, with a Heather sort of taking us out. Yes. Um, so one resource I wanted to point everybody towards is an August 2018 article that appears in Health Facilities Ma uh, Health Facilities Management Magazine. Um, the URL is on your screen, or you can just go to hfmmagazine.com and search. Uh, for their 20, August 2018 issue, um, and it's really intended to be a how-to guide for the designer, the equipment planner, um, how to implement and deploy the, the new imaging classification system. Um, and I hope that that resource is further helpful to you in terms of taking the information from this webinar and turning it into tactical, usable information. That concludes our presentation about the imaging room classifications and their appropriate use. So thank you very much, Brian and Toby, for a very informative presentation. I've received a couple of follow-up questions for you, so we're going to look at that next. Uh, the first one is, is I've seen many imaging room designs where there is no door between the control room and the imaging room. Is this still allowed? Would Toby, do you think you could take that one? Yeah, I'll be happy to take it. Um, the, it depends on which classification we're talking about. In class one, you don't have to have a door. You can have um, an opening, except for MRI, which for technical reasons you need to have that have a shielded uh, enclosure. Um, but as long as for the ionizing radiation modalities, you have appropriate uh, leaded. Uh, attenuating shielded surfaces, you can walk freely from uh, control into the exam room to the class one room. In class two, you can do the same, but you have to make sure that we're treating the air and the finishes and the materials in the control room um, exactly the same as we would in the procedural area. And when we get to class three, you're not allowed to do that anymore. There has to be a hard wall. There has to be an air barrier between the uh, control room and the OR procedure class three room. So that's a great question. Um, and the answer depends on where we are in our classification spectrum. Great. Brian, do you have anything to add to that? Okay, so we have one final question. Um, the imaging room space oh, is sorry, expressed in terms sorry, uh, Yvonne, uh, I yes. was on mute and I did want to, uh, sorry, um, I guess uh, I don't want to put Toby on the spot, but I guess I'm going to. Uh, you mentioned that in class three, you must have a hard wall and door and a physical separation from the control room. My understanding, though, is that it, you could eliminate the door if you design that um, control room, if you design, construct, and maintain that control room to the exact sta same standards as the class three imaging room, uh, you would be allowed to have that direct connectivity. I I am I wrong or? Uh, you, you may be right. I don't have the, the specific chapter and verse in front of me right now. Um, from a practical standpoint, uh, however, that would be very difficult to achieve. Um, so Totally agree. There, totally agree. Yeah. yeah. There, there may potentially be a way to do it without you know, getting sideways with the, the provisions of the 2018 FGI. Um, my recommendation would be to not do that uh, because uh, because everything that you just described would be extraordinarily difficult to, to achieve. Yes, I I completely agree. Um, if 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 one wants to take that route, it needs to be carefully considered uh, because there are there are major implications um, 
certainly major implications, uh, including the fact that not only are the environments combined, um, but you you would be required to be fully gowned, um, you know, within the operating uh, with within the actual uh, control room, et cetera. So, sorry, Yvonne. Um, Fair enough. Fair enough. So we do have one final question. The imaging room space is expressed in terms of clearance instead of square feet. So I, I know you uh, talked about this, Toby. The uh, uh, questioner asks, what factors should be considered to determine the total space in the room? Maybe you could summarize that. Uh, that that's another great question. Um, so I would I start with the you know the basic dimensions of the piece of equipment and anticipating that the building's going to be there for 30 40 50 years and the piece of equipment's probably only going to last 10 so i would actually do sort of a worst case and take a look at you know what other versions of this ct scanner mri scanner are likely to get sighted in this room you know, after this first one. And so essentially building in a little elbow room to the basic physical parameters of the equipment. I would look then, once I had defined my equipment space, I would look then at um, the minimum operational clearances that I needed for circulation, for moving the patient for, for the number of clinicians and equipment that would be necessary for the care of these patients based on the classification, based on the clinical utilization, and begin to define that. And then, and I'm kind of moving in a bullseye fashion from the middle outward um, in concentric rings, then I would define what my storage needs were around the periphery of the room, casework, cabinetry, rolling carts, um, that sort of thing. Um, and adding those three elements together, the equipment-related space, my clinical functioning space, and then my storage and material space at the, at the perimeter. And that would really drive the, the square footage. Um, it does require essentially three steps instead of somebody handing you a thou shalt be 250 square feet. But what it gets you is a space that is specifically tailored to the equipment and clinical function and the storage and material needs uh, for that space instead of an off the rack, um, you know, square footage number, which may or may not really be relevant to that particular application. Those are great points. Brian, did you want to add anything? No, I think uh, Toby covered it. It's great. Thanks, Yvonne. Excellent. Well, that's all the time we have today. So thank you for joining us and thank you very much. Uh, Brian Langlands and Toby Gilk, and special thanks to our participants today. Please remember to see the person you registered, who registered your site at the close of this session for information on receiving learning units or a certificate. You must be registered through MADCAD to take the survey and obtain credit. Now here's a look at the complete webinar series that FGI is offering on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction Documents. We hope you'll be able to join us for each presentation. Keep current with what's happening at FGI, including updates on adoption, errata, and the 2022 revision cycle by signing up for our quarterly newsletter, the FGI Bulletin, or follow us on LinkedIn. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.